Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's guest is a man who has many titles, electrician, city councilman, and candidate for the Vermont State House. And he will soon appear in the credits of a documentary about life on the Vermont-Quebec border during an earlier time. Today's guest is Tim Delabriere of Newport. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you for having me, Scott. So, how do you find time to do so many things? Oh, I'm, I've always been the type of person to keep busy. Um, I like to just be out there doing things, and it's kind of funny. I'm now at the stage where things are falling into my lap like this. I never would have guessed that I'd be taking part in a documentary. Um, it's, not, it's a little bit out of my comfort zone, but hey, uh, it's too big of an opportunity, and I, I think we need to represent, you know, our, our Vermont side of the border when, you know, um, people in Canada might not know much about the Derby Line Newport area, and this is going to primarily be a film for a Canadian audience all the way across, um, you know, the whole entire country of Canada, so I think it's, it's good. Right. And in your heritage, you are, you are French in Abenaki? Yeah, my dad's family is French Canadian. Um, I still have family members in Quebec and some, you know, actually everybody here knows Delabriere is up in Vermont, so we're <laughs> here too. But um, my mom's side of the family originates from a, a, an Indian reserve in Quebec called Odenac. And, and that's the yeah. Bernier family? Uh, it's Obamsuin, yeah, right. but that would be Skip Bernier's my grandfather, and um, our indigenous name would have been Obamsuin. Right. So, so uh, what is this? I know you're still learning about this film, but what do you know about it so far? Um, it seems to be it's going to be a little more artistic. It's not going to be something that's you know deep and rich in um, like the documentary style. I right. think it's going to be very theatrical and artsy, and I'm I'm really excited because I'm learning it learning things about it every day. Um, I know that the premise is basically um, a more contemporary how natives struggle with the border region crossing, you know, from Canada into the United States. And it's no different, you know, from people in Quebec from reserves coming down, you know, to Vermont or New, Ham New Hampshire and uh, New York to visit family members. So I think it's going to be some sort of retrospect playing on both contemporary and history. Right. And, um how were you how were you chosen for this film i know my grandfather played a role skip and then of course we've got some um family members and friends up at Odenak, and we were um we were basically recommended right. so you know there's a lot in the news lately about about the abenaki of vermont you have you have a fair amount of Abenaki in your blood, but are you Aben do you consider yourself Abenaki? And if not, what do you consider yourself? I consider myself a Vermonter. I mean, I was raised just like everyone else, and I think I, I do have Abenaki blood, but I was raised just like everybody else's children. You know, in the 80s, I was raised on MTV, playing outside. I mean, my cultural upbringing would be no different than most people, right. you know, in the Northeast Kingdom. So if I had to tie myself with any type of cultural um, group, I'd, I'd, I would identify myself as a Northeast Kingdomer. Right. I mean, I've got French Canadian blood, but really the only French word I can say is my last name. I mean, I, I love my, my heritage, but I think I, I view myself as a descendant of, you know, French Canadian people as well as Abenaki people, even though the bloodlines are there. But I respect people's opinions. People have different ways of interpreting what right. bloodlines mean. Um, I had a best friend in college who was 100% born and raised in Ireland, right. and nothing drove her crazy more than to hear people in the United States with an Irish last name say they're Irish, and she'd be like, are you Irish? What part of Ireland are you from? I mean, we all learn to self-identify in different ways. Right. So. Well, I think my philosophy is like yours, because uh, I recently wrote an article that's going to be published here right off. It's called, I'm a Vermont Mutt. Right. Uh, because... Uh, I might have Scottish in me, but I don't wear a kilt. Uh, I, I have French, but I'm not an aristocrat. I have English, and I'm not a king. And I also have some Native American, but I'm not an Indian chief. I, you know, I am the mixture of everybody. Right. So, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the Abenaki of the border region because. Uh, 
you know, when the first settlers arrived, we, our history, we, a lot of us Europeans like to think history began with us. Right. Uh, that wasn't the case anywhere, and that certainly wasn't the case here, because I have, I have diary entries. Uh, actually, one of the, the very first explorer on to Lake Memphis Magog talked about the huge number of Native Americans. He didn't label them as whether they were Abenaki or what tribe, but he, uh, he talked about the, the immense number of them, but he also talked about how friendly they were. Right. They, they welcomed him in, and they, uh, uh, the diary entry talks about the men folk were out uh, salmon fishing and moose hunting. Now, I'm not quite certain whether they were around here doing it or whether they, they also went elsewhere. So right. um, this area is steeped in Native American culture that far goes far, far before European people arrived. Right. And, and you also have to stop and think, you know, it wasn't just Abenaki that were living in Vermont. This was kind of like the, the crossroads, but just by the natural layout of the land with right. Lake Champlain and the mountain chains. People were coming back and forth, and that's what makes our, you know, our, our state rich with history, not just Native history, but, you know, if you look at more recent histories, um, I think we're very lucky to be in Vermont and to have, you know, such a ris rich historical, um, uh, I don't know, I'm just trying to think, you know, everything that happened in Vermont happened basically, in my, in my perspective, the land had great um, impact on shaping our history. I think the way people come together, earlier you were talking about becoming the Vermont mutt, and I think that we're all stuck in this rugged environment together, and I think our cultures tend to start not mixing in bloodlines, so to say, that's not what I'm saying, but we're all in this together. And I think that's where I identify more with having, you know, the Northeast Kingdom cultural upbringing and very proud of my roots here. So are you, do you pr pride yourself on being somebody who can withstand things that maybe some person in a more affluent area might not be able to I stand. loved it the past two years. Um, you know, just going down, my little brother was in Connecticut, my in-laws are in Connecticut, and just seeing the snowstorms and, you know, states of emergency and cars and tractor trailer trucks off the road everywhere. <laughs> and here comes dad flying down the highway in his Toyota Tundra, like, why is the state closed? I mean, <laughs> it, it's just, you know, we're, we're tough people and we help each other. And now, I think when it when it when it uh, is really cold out, are you one of those people that might exaggerate a little bit uh, about how cold it is so you can have the coldest temperature? Because I uh, I often find that to be the case yeah. is um, people they want to have the most snow, right. they want to have <laughs> the coldest temperature, and as we tape this show right now. We are in the middle of a heat wave. Oh gosh! And, and everybody's burning up right now. Right, and, and everybody, <laughs> all everybody, they they complain about the heat. Yeah. But they always put a little inflation to that temperature, though they can yeah. say they have the it's, hottest. It's funny. I'm not that type of person. I I like it all. I mean, I like the the heat waves a lot more than the snow. But it just reminded me of my great grandmother Elsie Cheney out in the middle, you know, in Troy, all by herself. Whenever you talked with Elsie on the phone, it was always. 10 degrees colder than anybody else. But then you start thinking, she might be in a cold spot. But it, it just gave her something to talk to you about, and she was happy, you know? I don't, complaining, not much of a complainer when it comes to the weather. So, at what age did you know, though, that you had Indian blood in you? Because I, I know your grandfather, so right. he had to have at least told you about it, because I know, unless that came on in his older years, he really likes to talk about it, right. share about it. No, we've all, I've always known. I think he's been very, you know, upfront in telling us about our family history. And I mean, it's something he's very passionate about and it's something he knows a lot about. But when you're younger, I think sometimes you don't see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm just starting to become, a, you know, a little more aware of how, how neat it is to be part of those types of families. And even on my dad's side, being part of a, you know, large French Canadian farming family, you know, out in the country and then dad or mom's family's more you know from Newport City and I, I think now I'm at the age just turned 30 a couple months ago but you start actually appreciating you know how you were raised and you know I'm starting to appreciate how lucky I actually am so I think I'm just now starting to put pieces together you know in the broader context you know not just 
hearing stories about you know what your great grandparents did. I think it takes you time to actually digest that. I, mean, I, I do believe that's the case, and fortunately, you have done that before your grandparents are all gone. Because right. a lot of times, people don't get to the point where you're at until it's too late. I'm very lucky to have Skip because Skip and even Eugene uh, Delabriere, I'm very lucky to have them here. And I was even lucky enough to have you know my great grandmother. I mean, she was you know, Cheney way back in the days out in the country, just hearing those stories and, you know, these are things you, you when you're a kid, they bounce off from you. But then now, once you start meeting, you know, third, fourth cousins that you didn't know, they start telling the same type of stories. And it's kind of really, like you said, I, I do consider myself extremely lucky to have, you know, Skip with his knowledge and how much he knows about, you know, local um, history. You know, the one thing I keep hearing about is that the, Abenaki were driven underground. They were, they were um, always here, but they were forced to hide their identity. Is there a lot of truth behind that, or did they just kind of assimilate into the culture? The biggest thing, and, and it's that's the hardest question to answer, because that you know we weren't just genetically stamped on the forehead where everybody did the same thing. Certain parts and pockets of the state, or New York, or even. Um, uh, Quebec, you got to stop and think about the wars happening that were splitting families, splitting mm -hmm. people up. Some people did stay. And I'm not, I would never use the word assimilate because back then if they just wanted to live their life out in their cabin and farm, that's what most Vermonters did. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to say they erased their own culture and decided to just be a certain way. I think we kind of overlooked, you know, what was really going on at that point because I don't know, everybody was just in the state where, hey, you know, let, let people live and do what they want. And I think that's kind of a, a Vermont value that lasts today. But then you also have the, the portions or the families that were forced on a reserve, forced up into Canada. Right. Some went, you know, um, down to Aquasasne. The, the families just split all over. So everybody's going to have oral traditions and they're all going to, you know, there, there has to be a person that can judicious, judicially look through and balance what's fair and accurate because mm -hmm. We also know how crazy oral traditions can be. Maybe I've got, you know, I've heard lots of funny stuff on my dad's side about <laughs> what they did up in Quebec, which is great. Right. But at some point, oral traditions are just, they're stories. Well, that's it. And, and, and sometimes, you know, if, uh, you know, if when one person says it, by the time it gets down like the third or fourth person, yeah. it, it's, it's kind of changed a right. bit. Like, um, I can, you know, I... I fully admit in some of my uh, my publisher's desk in my uh, uh, in my uh, Northland Journal, I I muse about things about an earlier time when I was growing up. But right, I fully admit that just maybe I'm not remembering things exactly right because you know you start getting back you know 47 right. years you start thinking well. How accurate am I? Well, look, just look at, I mean, all your, your viewers. I mean, we all have very colorful and funny members of our families and think 30 to 200 years ago, all it takes is one person who's a joker or a storyteller to make up a story about your family to entertain the kids. And that can be completely turned into whatever, you know, that they're, they're important because they, they shape your family and, and they, they kind of make your, your generations um, they, I guess they shape the path of your, your future generations, but just because they might not be historically accurate does not make them insignificant. Right. In, 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 like in, in our family, my wife's family, we actually have a person who has convinced himself that he is an Indian, right. and that's okay for him. It really, it is, if, if, that's, if that's his thing. Right. But on the other hand, as the real story is, my wife's family, are a bunch of British loyalists, right? And so um, it's always interesting how people take little bits of their history and run with it, right? Like we might have my wife's family might have this little teeny teeny bit of Native American, but we're, we're lar they're largely British loyalists, and this one person has taken that and run with it, and right. uh, a, a nice little. Funny thing that I saw, I will go back to my friend Claire in Ireland. I, I went out there and she used to tell me stories about her grandfather in Ireland mm -hmm. 
-hmm. would tell them stories about, you know, don't go running into the woods because there was Indians in the woods and they might, you know, run away with you. But at some point we all know there weren't Native Americans in Ireland, but that was a story her grandfather always told her. And she was, I mean, being in Ireland would know that it's, it's not probable. But could you imagine a hundred years ago here in Vermont, right. there would have been stories like that told for a very specific reason, keep the kids away from the woods. How do we know what's historically accurate and what isn't? That's where you'll probably, you know, um, find that interesting like I do. I'm a historian, but it, you can get seven to 15 historians in the same room, discuss one topic and have 15 right. different, you know, explanations oh, of sure. what happens. So that's what's kind of fun. Right. Now, uh, there's one, um, I, I believe it's the, it's the Newport history book. It has, um, it has a piece out of a diary, I believe. It was when Kelvin Arnold built his house up on the uh, Clyde, what is now the Clyde Pond. Because yeah. he built it back uh, in the early 1800s. And he talks about uh, the women folk wouldn't move there because of the deprivation of the savages. Oh. And in other words, they were afraid of right. they were afraid of the Indians living there. Well, you know, I've actually had in, in all of my studies, which I am not a trained historian, but I, I go through a lot, I haven't found that uh, I have only found that there was pretty much good relations between the Abenaki and the people of this well, region. There are lots of historical accounts, though, too, you know, of I, indigenous people kidnapping and raising children. Right. Not, there wasn't, I mean, it seemed more they were more happy raising people. And I don't, of course, we use the words kidnap or, I mean, do we know what happened? But you're talking back then, it was a very, I mean, it was strained relations all the way around. We were a newly forming nation, mm -hmm. things were happening. We don't really know. I mean, you had to stop and think, even the natives, when they were fighting wars out in upstate New York, there were so many different tribes who was, you know, who was uh, who at that point. So I've heard great things about Abenaki, but I might just be biased being right. Abenaki myself. Well, but. Um, the, uh, my next book is about the history of uh, Jay Peak. Yeah. And this, this person back in the 1800s had so much vision to, she actually sat down, one of the early settlers actually sat down and talked about what it was like. And uh, she talked about the large gatherings of, of uh, Native Americans that used to gather on Owl's Head right. at the uh, end, well, on the, uh, just across the border in Quebec. Right. And, uh, but on the other hand, in that same region, they also talk about in diaries Molly Ockett. Now, are you familiar with the Indian doctress and and all the good that she did for them? Uh, right. She doctored them back to health. But you know, even though they were there was a fear of Indian attacks, I have never come across any documentation. But on the other hand, is if there had been an Indian attack, this woman who documented everything. Well, she wouldn't be here today to have documented it. Well, yeah, not today, it's, but... It's, yeah, it's true. I mean, like you said, it's a fascinating history. And I know, personally, I, I know a lot more about Iroquois history. That's where I did my um, research at, you know, St. Lawrence University. But I'm, I'm just hearing, you know, bits and pieces of what I picked up ever since I've come back. And, of course, things my grandparents told me. But you're right. It's... It's almost like the hit, the native history here in Vermont, we're in a great crossroads where we can start gathering that information. And, and what a lot of people don't really talk about is the great relationship between, you know, the French or what we call now French Canadians and right. Native Americans. I mean, go, I, I've always been fascinated reading the accounts of how natives were treated by the French Canadians and then how they were treated by the Spanish, the English. Right. You know, one wanted to baptize right. and, and, you know, basically the whole crusades and conquering, you know, the South came right. through the Spanish. English wanted land and territory and the French were here were business partners. They were trading. Right. I mean, it's kind of neat just to see, you know, how different groups interacted with the Native people. Don't you wish you could go back in the time and just to see what life really was like back then and to see how accurate 
Yeah. We really are. I honestly don't think we'd be very accurate at all. That's probably why I would want to go back in time. I like the romanticized, you know, um, views we have of history, but I do. I guess there is always that being a historian, being curious. If you could just become a fly in the wall and, you know, go back in time and witness an event and see, you know, what, what would actually have happened in that instance. And, you know, I see a lot of it on city council meetings. We sit there and we're at a meeting and then we read about it in the paper the next day. We, re we read three different accounts of the meeting and it's very interesting to, th to see three completely legitimate you know, takes on, you know, the proceedings in the meeting, but then think you're the fourth, and it's just neat to see how everybody takes different bits and pieces of information. Okay, I saw, I recently read in the paper that you were sparring with the, the village of Coventry. Now, right. when I think of sparring, I typically think of that you were, you were really fighting in that, yeah. that room. What, was that what was going on? It wasn't my take at all, and I think your viewers will watch our city council meeting. I think we, you know, Mr. Maxwell and Mr. Marcotte came before council and aired their legitimate concerns. And I think the city council had, you know, their concerns. But in the end, we found that working together was both beneficial to Coventry and Newport. And it was far from needing hockey equipment. There was no um, <laughs> fighting involved. I think everybody was pretty civil. Yeah. But, you know, everybody comes into a meeting looking out for their constituents' concerns. And that's what I think in the end, I never would have chose the word sparring. But you know what? to each his own, and I think it was pretty, you know, well received. Back to the, uh, the Native Americans of the border, uh, I'm not sure if I ever even told, your, told you about this or if uh, you've read it is, but my daughter and a friend actually made the history books. Uh, I can't tell you what year it was. I believe my daughter was like six or seven, and uh, she and a friend were playing in Lake Salem. Right. And they were way down in the muck, and they were digging, and uh, they got down to the rocks, and they, they, they pulled up what they thought was an arrowhead. Because, right. you know, the word arrowhead is kind of bounced around. With Anything most, sharp and pointy is an arrowhead, right? right? Most <laughs> of the time, if they're, if they're back not too many hundreds of years ago, they were spear points. Right. And uh, they picked it up. They said, one of them said, hey, Mom, here's an arrowhead. Yeah. Threw it through the air. And I was there, and... I picked it up and my first response was, this is too perfect to be real. It right. was just so perfect. And I knew nothing about spear points. I, I later found out that most spear points here are like 2,000, 2000 years old. So when I, I brought it to B. Nelson, who has a vast knowledge of Native American history, she looked at it and she roughly guessed about 8,000 years old and I kind of nicely asked her what she'd been smoking. Uh, but then we, uh, yeah. uh, she had me bring it down to Giovanna Peebles, the right. state archeologist. Who's now this, the historic preservation officer, right? Isn't right. She the, yeah. And she um, looked at it and I, we was Scott Darlin, does that sound yeah. right? Uh, they looked at it and it's actually between 9,500 and 10,500 years old. Wow. It was a paleo Indian uh, spear point and they were all fascinated with it because it put it put Native Americans on the border before they thought they could actually live here right because they thought of uh, the uh, they thought that it was still too cold because because of the glaciers and, and you're gonna find that I mean just in my native studies at St. Lawrence people are still debating whether you know the Ice Age had any type of significant effect on you know certain areas so I think it's wonderful to have found that, and it, it, that's, those types of finds are, to me, we need to have some sort of like, um, this is why I'm, I've been passionate since I've been started. Right. We need a museum right. in the area, and I'm talking about like a st place where we can showcase, you know, native history. We've got, you know, the old stone house is wonderful. Right. We've got lots of places around, but I've always been passionate about, we've got the beautiful lake, which right. was important to people thousands of years ago, and apparently, you know, 10,000 right. years ago. I'd like to see something in Newport come where we can show off you know, I agree. things like that. Okay, Tim, we only have about three more minutes left. It's, that time went really fast. Is uh, Are you going to have to learn to, to speak Abenaki for this? Uh... I think so, and I'm going to be completely upfront with everybody. That's part of the, that's part of the uniqueness. Um, I've never claimed to even speak Abenaki. Um, it's 
There's very few people who speak it fluently today, but I think that's part of the, the crux, you know, going back in the contemporary times. And so I am going to have to sit there and do my homework, and I've got people up at Odenak that are going to be helping me, I hope. <laughs> so I, we're going to, that's part of it. I'm going to have to learn a, a poem. So if you're going, if you're going up to Odenak, is there's a lot of French speakers there too. So you're gonna absolutely you, you're gonna have French, which you said you're not fluent at. I can pick it up by hearing it. I mean, playing hockey in Quebec and then have, being part of a big French Canadian family. Right. But the good thing with Odenac, there's a lot of English speaking people, right. and then I've got my grandfather, right. who can go back and forth between right. French and English. So, so if people want to find out more about this movie, because you're just learning as you right. go, how can they find out about it? Well, the Haskell. The Haskell Library has a website, and the event is explained. Um, uh, there's contact information for people who are interested, and in, um, the event is free and open to the public. And, um, it's, and it's actually going to be filmed during it, that event. Yeah, the, the, the portion of the movie that I'll be in will be filmed at the, the library in front of everybody, and it's going to be yeah, a live-type production. And So we all get to hear you speak. Oh. Your, your, your native tongue. My attempt, and it's not a native tongue I have, but it's the native tongue of my people, yes. Have you learned anything yet in Abenaki? No. So you're starting right from scratch. Absolutely, and I think, you know, I'm being fair and honest with people. That's, the, I guess that's part of what they wanted, and um, I think it's going to be fun. And you're going to have an Abenaki ancestor from... The yep. Canadian side. We're going to have, there's going to be another representative from Odenac, and they're going to, it's going to, basically it's touching upon, you know, struggles currently crossing the U.S.-Canadian border. So right. it's got a, you know, a different topic, not just Native American peoples, but I think the scope is historically how Natives cross the border and how today border communities struggle, right. you know, and that's kind of, okay. yeah, so we'll have, I, we'll have somebody from Odenac there as well, a large contingent of people from Odenac in okay. Canada. Okay, Tim, I want to thank you for coming on the show, and it was fascinating having, uh, having you on because I love talking history with you. Well, thanks for having me. I like talking history with you, too. So, <laughs> Okay, and I want to thank the viewers for tuning in today. Thank you.